Welcome to a conversation between May Abdallah and Monica Gagliano, presented by Orleans House Gallery as part of Cultural Reforesting, a programme inviting all to ask the question, how can we renew our relationship with nature? Over the, part, over the weekend of the 23rd of October, award-winning creative studio Anagram will present messages to a post-human earth in the woods at Orleans House Gallery in London. Messages to a Post-Human Earth is an interactive, multi-sensorial journey for two people to do together, embarking on an evocative audio journey featuring augmented reality to reimagine our relationship with the natural world. The story explores the pioneering and fascinating work of Monica Gagliano, an essay by science fiction writer Stanislav Lem, which he wrote for the Human Interference Task Force in the 1980s. Lem's essay was written in response to requests for ideas of what to do with the waste and its incredibly long lifespan. He suggested encoding messages into the DNA of plants. Anagram specialised in thought-provoking interactive storytelling and immersive experience design. From meticulously designed theatrical sets to ancient buildings to just about anywhere outside in the wild, each piece gets you entangled with a place. With a background in documentary film, animation and interactive game design, the studio specialises in exploiting the most recent advances in immersive technology, including VR, AR and other XR tools. May is co-founder and director of Anagram. Monica's main research is broadly focusing on key aspects of the ecological processes by which organisms can gather information on the variable conditions of their surrounding environment in order to thrive. In collaboration with various disciplines across the sciences and humanities, her research aims at expanding our perception of animals, plants, and more generally nature. In the process of learning how to do this, Monica has pioneered the brand new research field, plant bioacoustics, and extended the concept of cognition to plants, reigniting the discourse on plant subjectivity, sentience, and ethical standing. Over to Monica and May. Thanks, Andy. Thank that you. Was, that was exciting <laughs> to hear <laughs> who we are. Um, That's so, uh, so, um, so we're going to have a natural conversation. Oh, you may. What was the question? Sorry, I lost it for a second. How am I? Yeah. <laughs> Um, how are you doing? <laughs> that's how normal conversations would begin, right? Um, uh, I am I am good. I could basically do with a bit of a taste of my own medicine and go and spend a little bit more time <laughs> connecting to nature. But we came back from Poland last night where we were showing messages to a post-human earth in Krakow at the botanical gardens at the university. And <clears throat> yeah, had like amazing feedback from people there who are already campaigning to make it a permanent installation so that's exciting um uh, and, beautiful yeah. yeah i i guess in a way i was as we were talking just before i was thinking about the first conversation we ever had when i contacted you um just at the very beginning of this project to see if you'd have a chat with me and i didn't really expect you to reply but you did. <laughs> and um, I told <laughs> you that um, we wanted to make an intimate journey <laughs> that used technology, but really didn't really um, use technology as a barrier between humans and the natural world. And I remember how quickly and easily we connected and I, I still think that's really amazing. And I think that we connected on a few different things, which was, um, you know, I guess I was a little bit intimidated because, you know, you're a scientist and really that's your kind of identity in the world is as a scientist. But I wanted to make a piece that like disregarded science. And I thought I had to hide that from you a bit. And, <laughs> um, and I just felt that actually you also wanted people to disregard science, which was somehow kind of amazing and shocking at the same time that you were up for that. Because we talked, I really remember very clearly, we talked about the research, you told me about your research. Obviously it's fantastic. Obviously it's out there in the public domain for people to find. 
but we also talked about how people's reliance on experts was somehow in itself, even though it sometimes intellectually excited them about plants, it was also a kind of barrier towards their real experience. They mm. didn't really, we talked about the lack of trust that people have to just see something and wonder themselves what it is and feel like they have an answer that they can perceive without having to Google it or find the right person to tell them what to do. Um, and it's <clears throat> interesting, you know, because we were in this botanical garden in Krakow and the really the way botanical gardens kind of present themselves is like plant Latin name. And you're like, of all the things that I need to know about this plant to tell me it's Latin name is like, it's such it's such a colonial approach <laughs> to like how your this kind of apex of this institution, which is about presenting plants, it's like, is what people want to know the Latin name of this plant? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I think that really excited me that although you, I felt that very strongly, you know, you had this you needed you knew the power of your kind of scientific research and that credibility to some degree but you were also really up for playing with it and kind of using it for whatever purposes or kind of yeah so what could you talk to me a bit about that because I, I just really want to like from your perspective kind of what's that playfulness in your mind or, and what's your own relationship to yourself as a scientist mm, I remember our initial conversation too and uh, and I remember that yeah I knew that I was getting approached as the scientist and uh, and I, I I think and I'm doing this more and more um, I'm trying to dismantle that identity myself for myself first of all uh, because uh, the scientist is just a, a thing that I do that I can choose to do or not but it's not who I am and, uh, and when we talk about connection and, and connecting or reconnecting, rewiring ourselves into the web of nature that we are part of it regardless, but reconnecting with awareness, I guess, that's the human that needs to be involved, not the scientist. The scientist is the same as you said, oh, there are the Latin name of the plants. It's like, yeah, that can be beautiful in itself. It's useful at times, but fundamentally, who cares? <laughs> like fundamentally, I can connect to a plant without even knowing the name. And, uh, and it's interesting that you bring up the question of the, the name because uh, of course the science has this uh, necessity, I guess, for its own um, practice to name things and put them in different boxes with different names. And so these, uh, compartmentalization of knowledge is uh, it's quintessential to science, at least to modern science, and uh, in a way to its own detriment because it's become so compartmentalized that now uh, outside that little box, I don't know anything. And uh, so I guess, uh, um, you know, when, when a project like yours comes to as an experience because it, it keeps reminding me that, um, What's important is who I am. And then I can express that through the science or in many other ways. But the, if I want to talk about connection, I, the, the human being, needs to be the one that is doing the job, basically is connecting or is searching or is uh, questioning or is wondering or is playing. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that... Um, you know, I find it kind of entertaining in a way when some of my colleagues get upset about um, the fact that it seems as if I'm not caring and if I'm against science. No, I think science is wonderful, but I also like music and painting. <laughs> and to me, they have the same value, they're no less. And uh, in natural fact, sometimes they're much better and healthier places for me to be than not in front of a computer or, or in front of a data set. And um, so, yeah, the, 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 the aspect of play in our practices, whether they're scientific or not, uh, I think is really important. And science seems to uh, forget about that a lot. And then it becomes so serious and it, 
And the more serious it becomes, the more uh, compartmentalized it becomes because then he doesn't want to hear anything anymore. And I don't think that's good science. And so when a project like this come along, it's inspiring me to, to if I'm gonna do science, to do better science, which is in a way, possibly a, a science that maybe it's new or maybe it's old, I don't know really, but it's a science that we have forgotten how to do. So mm. I don't know. And I have to, I have a bit of a confession, which is like, um, and it's probably why I, I, I'm so excited about working with you, which is that um, there's something about your attitude, which genuinely, like, I think st <laughs> stresses me out somehow. And I just want to kind of <laughs> unpack that a bit, which is that, like, I appreciate that you, there's something that, I, and I feel like this is, kind of in so many sectors, which is you don't play the scientist role that I feel sometimes I want you to play, right? I, I want you to speak in like a particular way to refer to the experiments in the lab, to tell me about how, you know, to keep justifying your role. And I find this kind of anxiety that happens when we speak, where I'm like, oh, Monica's going, into a realm of something that is not calculatable. She is now going to talk about experiences that may have been, you know, part of traditional ceremonies, which I kind of, as somebody kind of raised in a deep, you know, like a, a deep kind of intellectual homeland of the British empire, um, I find it nerve wracking. And I find myself kind of constantly trying to, in my mind, pull you back to like playing this role to kind of reassure me that your everything is kind of statistically verified. And, um, <laughs> and I think that I, I was aware of that kind of anxiety the first time we spoke and um, I kind of found it interesting, but genuinely I did find it a little bit um, alarming that you could swing so freely between kind of data sets and ayahuasca and it, it it and in my head I think you know like as a product of <laughs> you know the empire in many ways and kind of um in many ways a scientist myself to some degree I I, I wanted you also to stay in your box and the plants to be in their boxes and the hierarchy to remain you know, intact. And there's a degree to which um, I think that's partly why, like, this project really drives me because I'm constantly trying to try and lubricate the edges in myself. And also, I, I, I'm kind of assuming only like by extension that this is something that perhaps other people are going to find challenging, which is, you know, um, there's your title you know, and there's your field work. And then there's these other conclusions that you draw, which can play, make complete logical sense, but are not presented in the same kind of cold, perfunctory, precise, precise manager, which is, I feel almost like part of the theater of what we require from science. Like, I think we also talked a little bit about the way headlines are written in, um, in the UK, where there's often this kind of you know the purpose somehow of papers is is to is to is to kind of lead science as if it's a kind of religion where you hear statements such as like scientists prove x y then like you know and it's like this this way in which there is for those people to prove x y and z they need to have they need to have a certain kind of title, they need to have written in a certain way, and it, it becomes a kind of reassuring convention, I think, for us to know that the world is knowable. Mm. And whereas we can't believe priests or musicians, but we that you're the people that we can believe. And so it's kind of, well, if I'm gonna outsource my belief to you, then I need you to be stable. And, and somehow there's this instability, which I feel, by realizing that my belief actually is something that I need to be responsible for and not something that I can just trust scientists in kind of headlines to, to tell me. So, um, and I just, as you were talking then, I was kind of aware of that anxiety kind of <laughs> coming back where it's, you know, um, 
and you say, I remember last time we spoke, actually, you were saying you, you really want to do more work with plants that are not in a lab because this is an artificial mm-hmm. environment. And of course, you know, taking six species and putting them in test tubes and observing their behavior, like why, why on earth would we think that that would in itself not change its behavior you know like it's kind of almost by extension if we were to imagine putting five humans in a lab and kind of analyzing them and saying this is like a good representation of what humans do in like normal society and and there was a real that kind of really you know that was again another moment where I was like, well, I do actually want you to stay in the lab, <laughs> Monica, <because laughs> you're a scientist. And if you're actually just going to go and prance around in the woodlands, um, how am I going to know that you found the truth? Because the truth will be so messy um, in such an entangled experience. And I, and I kind of found that. But um, perhaps you can talk a little bit about like this, like outside of the lab phase, which I feel... Um, kind of in the few times we've spoken I've kind of mentioned that there's like an evolution and yes how far away are you from the lab right now <laughs> I, I, right now I'm inside my home and <laughs> uh, my lab is uh, inexistent in the sense that I'm not doing a lab lab work and and I'm very happy about that um, there's been work done in the field and, uh, and this reminds me, which is really quite amazing, that, um, well, there is so much in what you just uh, shared. Once I would start from the anxiety and then <laughs> to make you even more anxious, but I promise I'll get to the lab. <laughs> um, so the anxiety that you feel, it's actually, in a way, it's, um, it's great. And it means that you are in, on the right track for... Uh, those who will see, uh, you know, the, the final product, the final um, um, presentation that you're going to offer. Because <clears throat> the anxiety that you feel is the anxiety that I had to feel when I had to go from the science that we do and that I'm trained to do is like this. And it's got certain boundaries and it's got certain boxes and you do not question certain things because there is no need to question, although we're supposed to be questioning everything. But yet this is unquestionable. It's dogmatic in a way, but that's how we are trained. And even the idea of being dogmatic is not on the radar until you realize how dogmatic you are. But to, to do that, then you have to... You do have to confront the anxiety of what that means for your own practice. And, and of course, the entire process for me happened over a, a decade where I had to, and uh, you know, at least you're looking quite graceful with your anxiety. You should have seen me. <laughs> <laughs> like tears of like, I don't know, I don't know how to do my work. I don't know if I can even do my work anymore. Um, how can I work with this? Now that I can see that I'm inside a very specific box and the box is a bit tight and I don't think this is actually telling me really anything about nature or about the, uh, the answers that I'm looking for to the question that have arised. And so, um, so by extension, if I have transmitted successfully my anxiety to you, <laughs> then I think that uh, you will transmit successfully your anxiety, which is a good anxiety, to those who will come in and check out your work. Now, the anxiety, uh, and, and now to freak you out a little bit more, the anxiety that you describe, I actually, um, as I said, I had it on and off for like a decade because it was a constant battle between like uh, doing the work as I, I was taught to do and then trying to find my own way, stay within the game so that it would still bridge the bodies of knowledge and practices uh, close enough, but not totally too close because otherwise then I lose what I'm supposed to be doing too. And, uh, but one day I remember sitting in the woods <laughs> and, um, and completely like anxiety riddled and I was just like lying on the ground, looking up. And uh, it was a pine forest and there was a bit of wind and the pines were really like swaying on and off. And, and, uh, and I literally, in my mind, I just said like, uh, 
I, I can't do this anymore. I don't know how to do this. It's just too much. I don't know how to do this. And what came into my mind was like flexibility is the key. And I know it seems pretty trivial, but that was coming from the pines. And that was showing me what it means to be in the wind and be flexible. Otherwise, you break. And if you're really going to grow and, and flourish, you want to be uh, flexible and movable. And so, in a way, I think that describes what I am attempting to be in the process of doing my work. And sometimes I'm like, eh, and I can feel that rigidity. And then I had to consciously go in that place and kind of massage it. So that it's like, it's okay, it's okay. You're supposed to feel like that because you just bumped into another box. The other thing that um, another plant told me about anxiety in the boxes, he said, um, well, anxiety is useful because this is a, um, a feeling that tells you that you are at the edge of your box and it's time to break the wall. So that then eventually there will be another box that will contain you again and again and again. But this one, if you feel anxious and you're bumping against it, it's because it's done its job and it's time to move on. So mm -hmm. I guess what I do in my work is I try to break down those boxes as soon as I, I bump against those walls, which are my own, but I also, I guess, in, because my practice is not just for me, uh, I guess it becomes a, an exercise that I do on behalf of others, or at least I might inspire others to do uh, the same, I don't know. Yeah, totally. now and I will again, go. Sorry. No, no, oh, I was just going to agree. I was going to take it. you back to the lab, but <laughs> yeah. I think. Well, actually, it. before you do that, I wanted to read this extract actually because it really just. Um, it's from Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is uh, one ah, of yeah. the writers in your forthcoming publication, The Mind of Plants, which you've edited, kind of a series of essays. And we'll come back to the lab, but uh, just on this, because of the dancing pines, um, yeah. um, I'm going to read this out because I think it, it really helps kind of ground the experiential part of what you're talking about when we talk about receiving communication or messages or learnings. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little long, but I'll read it in full. The indigenous story tradition speaks of a past in which all beings spoke the same language and life lessons flowed among species. But we have forgotten or been made to forget how to listen so that all we hear is sound emptied of meaning. The soft mm. sibilance of pine needles in the wind is an acoustic signature of pines, but this well-known whispering of pines is just a sound. It is not their voice. What if you were a great teacher, a holder of knowledge and vessel of stories, but had no audible voice with which to speak? What if your listeners presumed you to be mute, save for the passive whispering of your pines? How would you bring your truth into the world wouldn't you dance your story in branch and root? Wouldn't you write it in the eloquence of cellulose, in the lasting archive of wood? Plants tell their stories, not by what they say, but by what they do. They tell their story in their bodies, in an alphabet once as familiar as the song of every bird, which we have also forgotten, as we became afflicted not only with plant blindness, but with plant deafness as well. So I just thought of that as I imagined you kind of witnessing the dancing pines. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, I, I love Robin's work, um, but I feel that to some degree, just you discussing your anxiety there, I think what I connected to was the fact that you really are in an edge between these two places. And I felt that for the kind of audience of me and of the kind of people who I feel were really value this kind of trying to cross that boundary between what they know to what they don't know you you are a kind of bridge because you take us from that familiar place to the unfamiliar place whereas kind of if we were to try and leap forward into kind of indigenous practices and indigenous knowledge I feel that we don't go wholeheartedly because there's part of us that still says this is other this is unknown this is not familiar and so that kind of I feel like potentially that journey that people take in the peace messages to a post-human earth you know so much about its design is about supporting 
you to let go and accept that mm -hmm. you're not crazy to want to read the communication from plants and that's to me like kind of you know the question which is how can I take myself seriously and unlearn all of this nice hierarchy that I have between the human mind and the mind of the plant where my mind is so good <laughs> and their mind is <laughs> a mechanical instinct to move towards light and nothing more hmm. Well, um, again, amazing so much. And uh, I will take you to the lab. Yes, uh, safe to um, the lab, please. And if you could wear a white right. coat and be called doctor. Then I that's would right, which, which you see, I never, ever wear, ever, even when I'm in the lab, because it's not my style. <laughs> and the labs that I use are, are not required. They didn't used to require a lab coat anyway. So I could have worn it if I wanted to look like a, a real serious scientist or not. Um, okay, again, lots of stuff there. Um, do you know, you spoke of bridging and, um, and you know, the bridge is a place of, anxi of anxiety because it's nowhere. It's not into the safety of what we know. It's not even in the safety of the unknown because if you were totally unknown and totally surrendered, ah, at least you're somewhere. Instead, the bridge sits right in between those two. And that is the tension. You know, you need the tension to hold the bridge. It's almost like a, a bridge without tension would be not safe to cross anyway, and it wouldn't be a bridge. So I guess, and it's the first time actually, thank you, because it's the first time that I'm thinking of this, because I know that I, I, I cause anxiety to some people. And, um, but yeah, helping me to understand that actually it is indeed part of my offering. And now there's like, a, here we go, I'm, I'm giving anxiety, you know, for free. But actually, um, it's not anxiety, it's tension. The tension that is required to cross and not only to cross one way to another way. So it's not just to go from science and the safety of the controlled environment to the wild and unruly of the unknown, but it's to also go back and forth. So that then you're comfortable with that bridge rather than, because, you know, if you get stuck in one or the other, you have exactly the same problem. And again, going back to the pine, flexibility. So especially in the UK, you know, I remember when I was there, I did my undergrads in Bangor and it was the first suspension bridge that I really saw and felt under my feet, you know. And suspension bridges are a bit freaky because if you're not used to it, it's like, the, the bridge is moving are we sure it's okay <laughs> and it's moving over like a really cold water this thing comes down but that's the thing there is uh, there there is a lot in that there is uh joining these two places which once you step on the bridge are both you know unknown in a way and then there is a sense of trust that the bridge will hold and the 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 holding comes from its flexibility from the fact that it is not rigid but it's movable all the time. So, and it allows you, sometimes it might swing a little bit closer to one side or the other side, or no way, it swings in those directions that are just not one or the other. And so I think that the bridge uh, metaphor is perfect. And, um, and I kind of really like that um, if I'm doing my work well, then people will feel that tension which they might don't recognize as tension, but anxiety to start with, but uh, it is the tension that is required. And um, I think that it would be the best wish that I could wish to anyone to always feel in tension because life is always in tension, in tension, <laughs> also in tension. <laughs> um, you know, is always creating, is always moving, is always uh, joining, is always connecting, and the entire web needs to adjust all the time. So it actually represents exactly what life is. Now, the interesting part of all of this <laughs> is that, um, you know, I am been, I was trained and I, I have done my, much of my work in the field. So I'm a field ecologist. 
And as an ecologist, uh, we are very comfortable with messiness because it's part of the deal. It's like you're never, ever going to get clean data. And actually, when you do, you should be very suspicious. And it feels like some, I did something wrong here. It cannot be that clean. It's not possible. Um, now, then I ended up in the lab because of the questions that I was asking. And for me to uh, approach those questions of plant communication and learning in the field, which is where they are really happening and where they are really useful, uh, it would have not served the purpose of that science because it needed to build the bridge first. So as an ecologist, we are com comfortable with uh, the messiness. We know that, um, you know, is always complex, is always uh, unresolved, it remains unresolved. So we are uh, okay with that tension of it's unresolved and it's, going, it's meant to be like this. While those that work in the lab are primarily biologists, not ecologists. Ecologists are, uh, are interested in the big questions that are happening out there. The biologists are usually interested in the details and the mechanistics of, you know, uh, why does it work like that? Or how? How does it work like that? What are the moving parts that make it work like that? Well, I guess as an ecologist, we are more interested in uh, why, the big why, what process, you know, what thing is doing this, but what process is creating this? So... As you can see, even the questions are different, even the feeling of the question is different. So I had to kind of step into this um, out for a little while. And so I went into the lab, but that was never my place. And so what I did, I did it because I knew, I understood that that was part of the first part of the bridge that I needed to build. But once that is done, I'm actually not interested at all on uh, the moving parts that make the bridge. I'm interested in what the bridge is going to join together and who, who is going to walk on it. And um, so I guess the, um, the lab and the science that we think of that is done in science laboratories, and we identify even just the stereotype of like uh, the scientist with the white coat in a lab with pipettes and test tubes, you know. Um, yeah, that is actually a very specific kind of science. And, um, and it's true, our society has been giving a lot of importance to that science, but that is the kind of science that also creates some of our problems too. Not always, I'm not, you know. So that is like, you know, a lot of the genetic research is done in that context. And, uh, and you know, I have plenty of colleagues who work in genetics, they're nice people. <laughs> but, well, you know, I remember even when I was working still in marine science, I was like, uh, they, they hardly care about the animal or the, the critters where the samples came from. They just want to have the samples. And as long as the label is correct, they don't care because they're interested in those little details. But as you can see, as soon as you enter inside a um, sanitized, soil controlled space, which is the lab, yeah, it makes you, the human, feel so good because suddenly it feels that you're a little bit more in control and that tension seems to ease in the background. The anxiety seems to go. But in reality, um, you're, you just dissected something out of the hole and then you are expecting that the little details is going to describe everything. And you're just, I don't even know what that little details really mean because it cannot be extrapolated and described by dissecting it away from the rest. And as we know, it's like, you know, as soon as you, even with humans, as soon as you move the human in a different condition, it's not going to be a normally, naturally, uh, this is what we do though. We put things, we, we extract and then put little things in isolation and expect that those little details are supposed to describe the big picture. So I had to do that to make a point, to make the point according to the, the language and the rules of expectation of science uh, that, okay, so look what I found, this is possible. 
But now uh, I'm not interested really. Like a lot of times I get questioned about like, yeah, but how does it, how does the plant do this? And what kind of chemical or what kind of whatever genetic machinery is like, a, I don't know. And honestly, I don't care because I'm interested in the bigger process. And, uh, and I don't think that knowing that is like the name in Latin. It's not gonna help me to understand me as the nature that I'm observing in the plants that I work with or the animals that I work with. Because ultimately, let's face it, it's a, it's a total uh, selfish and self-centered exercise. What we are searching is ourselves and we're searching everywhere. We're searching everywhere outside. <laughs> And, uh, and every time that we dissect someone else, we're actually dissecting away the human too. And so for me, the only way, if we are serious about finding ourselves, which is what we are looking for, then we need to uh, allow these others, apparently others, to show themselves for who they are and not for what we want them to be, which is often what science construes by extracting them from the environment that actually makes them who they are and puts them in environments that don't mean anything. So when so, you say that you, um, you'd you had to do that to prove a point, can you, can you explain what was that point then? What do you feel like, what was the message that you wanted people to, what, what, what was enough? What did you need people to see? Well, plants are uh, beings, they are communicative and they are very smart. They're intelligent in the sense that like they can make choices and they can learn and remember things, uh, which we don't, we, at least I think we used to definitely not uh, really care about. And uh, in the context of, uh, you mentioned it before, in the context of uh, colonial um, time, which is still totally nice and well until now, still. Um, is not, colonialism is not something in the past, unfortunately. Um, yeah, uh, by, um, by ignoring those properties of these others, we are justifying violence. And so by doing a science that actually is in service of these others. And I, like my job was basically to allow the plants to show themselves in the best way they, they could, not to force them to do something, but to say like, okay, if you can learn, how do I create an environment within these controlled settings that science requires that will recognize because they are familiar to this practice? How do I create a, some, some kind of setting that allows you, the plant, to show yourself? So once that's done, that's what I mean is like, from that perspective, I, I, I've done my job. Yeah, yeah. Are you anxious? <laughs> <laughs> Andy, you've unmuted, so I feel like- Unmuted, um, yeah. Because I was just, um, one of the things I found fascinating about uh, the work was thinking about this plant and, kind of um, really getting into what you were going through almost um, in what you talked about just now and kind of in your work um, is, this, it feels like the searching for the language to express what, what it is that you're doing and attempting to do. And um, you in, obviously know, have a clarity to, the, that that kind of why that feels full of all the meaning you need it, need it to, to feel but then actually expressing that um like how how that clarity why does that clarity feel so far removed from our language in 2021 certainly in English that it doesn't help us discuss things that feel so clear and so important and so um so obvious really in terms of mm -hmm. us and our relationship mm -hmm. to the world around us yeah yeah well that um is exactly why we need nature expressed through the arts 
whether it's music or any other artistic uh, space, because um, the language of science has got certain limitation. And that's why, as well as May was saying, like, you know, she wants me to speak like a scientist. <laughs> and, uh, but, um, but actually, I don't think that the language of science might be the best language to describe this. And that's why we, I find myself often like, um, yeah, very limited in that. But um, the feeling, and as you said, like these relationship and these feelings are so obvious. And when I've been asked before, like, uh, how would you translate this for someone else that hasn't had that experience? It's like, well, really the only way to do it is for you to have your own experience. But you are having your own experience all the time. You're breathing air, you're eating food, you're like, you know, you're alive, doing life. So um, I think that uh, through the arts and different artistic expression, we can give language to something that might not be necessarily a matter of words. So the language doesn't have to be just words, but it can be embodiment of different kinds. And, and I think, especially at this time, I find myself looking to the arts more and more because I find that that is at this time they are needed more than ever and in a way uh, you know May what, what you guys are doing with with the project is exactly that it's like there was a you know because the, if I remember correctly the initial impetus was from the work of a scientist describing oh, science fiction but there was a scientific basis of like describing how do we uh, address a problem and uh, yeah the scientists could come with very various solutions maybe but um, really the problem fundamentally is that we don't want to repeat the problem and to not repeat the problem you need to feel it and so it's uh, one thing to know what the problem is and another one is to feel it. And I think that by feeling it and that embodiment, and that's where, again, the arts and, uh, help us to feel in different ways, um, we can maybe uh, gain or approach the wisdom that is encapsulated in that experience rather than the knowledge of. Because the knowledge, like we got plenty of knowledge, and actually, Mr. Google knows much more than any one of us put together <laughs> these days. So, but um, but Mr. Google doesn't know what he feels, and how to reach that wisdom is only through the experience of living. Yeah, all the time spent <laughs> with um, other cultures. Really this um, approach, I guess, that you have is about kind of philosophical and kind of um, science from a approach, and and combine that kind of an immersive aspect to it, which again is what May's work, this project is about, kind of not just it happening in a gallery space or in a theatre or in a kind of, again, that prescribed white box space that kind of removes you a little, but actually in, in the place itself, immersed, surrounded by trees, birds and everything else, and what that adds to um, what people might take away, hopefully take away. That's right. I mean, if we think about even just a few centuries ago when you know, the naturalist, that's how we call them, you know, uh, they used to sit and observe, sit and observe quietly. <laughs> so, I mean, Darwin did that, um, you know, so many before him did that. And even if we go back, 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 everyone before us has done that. That's the only way you have to just sit quietly and observe. And I think that um, in a sense, when, at least from my experience, very limited experience, but um, my interaction in an indigenous context has always really been about just shut up and listen and just sit quietly. And listening means listen to the other humans around you, but also and maybe even more importantly, listen to the every everything else that is here 
And uh, in Australia, there is the expression of like, uh, you know, listening to country. And uh, again, I think it's a very difficult thing to understand unless you have been on country in these places where you can really literally hear the power and the aliveness and even the heartbeat of the place. And, um, and then it's really obvious what listening really means. So I, yeah, again, I agree with you. I think that uh, a piece like May is, uh, is gonna take people in this immersion because this is exactly what we need instead of like, oh, we tell you about it or you can watch it from the distance. It's like, no, 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 you need to get dirty with it. <laughs> you need to really get your hands in the soil to know what soil is and yeah, so it's great. Yeah, it's actually quite interesting, isn't it? I think just to really just talk about what that synergy is, because I think in many ways, you're a scientist that doesn't necessarily want to be called a scientist, but it's happy to use it. But really, it's an invitation for other people to come and do something. And I think I probably feel quite similar about the term artist. It's like, whatever, I can be whatever you want me to be. But like, I only make interactive work and interactive work by its nature is incomplete until it is mm -hmm. interacted with it's only really I can only really make a third of the piece the other third is the environment and the last third is the participant and they're the people that spin it together and the more they bring the more they have you know mm -hmm. and I think like our very first project, Door Into the Dark, it was a 45 minute blindfolded experience about the feeling of being lost. And, you know, it was really an exercise in saying, hey, what if I give you a lot that you have to bring, you know? And the reason I think people responded so strongly was because there was so much space for them to bring themselves and their relationship to that feeling and to explore that that they actually went very far like the interaction was quite demanding and in that demand there was there was a bigger offer but really like it wasn't me that brought that ever that was always just the space mm -hmm. for them to fill and um and so there's this this kind of I guess um, I, both of us have this desire to um create the circumstances where reflection and feeling can take place but ultimately that reflection that feeling is is theirs and that's where I feel is like a powerful place for change and where perhaps you know of course you know like activism is extremely important but also perhaps the precursor to some of that wise or thoughtful activism is that um, context for observation and to move past seeing what you expect to see into what is really there and then realizing the dissonance between what was expected and what takes place and then having the opportunity to kind of restitch those realities together and mm -hmm. ultimately be different at the end of it which is a, a high expectation but um creating those circumstances and in a way, you know, like the, the reason I feel that we really connected over this science fiction writer's essay, because there's this kind of madness of the story about the human interference task force, the kind of the, you know, as somebody who's always worked with documentary, the fact that it is a true story, like is very important because it is about kind of drawing attention to this, the madness of the moment that you would have to design a language to warn future intelligent life that you've kind of accidentally poisoned the planet irretrievably into the <laughs> next hundred millennia and need to do something about it and the fact that really we kind of begin you know we begin there really in the story you don't necessarily begin with the plant you begin in this very human kind of civilization is it's, it, we're talk, effectively we're talking about kind of stepping outside of our own time and looking at kind of a very long period of time but ultimately it's it's 
it's a story that's difficult not to make someone feel quite reflective. You know, it's it's very not about now. It's not about it in many ways. It is about COVID and it is about like things that take place that affect species. I feel like COVID really um, made people feel aware of us as kind of life forms that were vulnerable in the same way that you know, viruses can spread along populations of every single organism on earth. We too are a body of organisms that are vulnerable. And there was this, not, not just a necessarily humility about our organizational capacity to deal with the health implications of this, but just, oh, our organizational capacity as organisms. So there was this moment which I felt that there is this kind of possibility of seeing ourselves as organisms which is a starting point to feeling a kind of kinship with other organisms and be like oh if we're going mm. through this thing right now has this ever happened to you guys what did you do you know it's it's just so it's so biological <laughs> we are such we're so kind mm -hmm, of aware of our right. biology at the moment like our mouths and our our noses are suddenly like more important than just like our outfits and our laptops or whatever mm -hmm. and actually this reminds me of two things um one uh, in the context of time and you spoke about like this is not about now actually it is about now but it's just that the way in which we perceive time recently you know our generations our last few generations of humans um, this wasn't the same way as we have perceived for a long time, though. Time was always, and again, in an indigenous context is often spoken of like, you always have to think of seven generations ahead. So what you do, is it going to impact the next seven generations? Then you don't do it, or you choose what you do based on what is the impact or the benefit for the, for the future. So everything that you do now does matter because it has consequences. So in a way, it's, it's even more about now than ever because we have forgotten that the now does matter for a long time. The now lasts a long time. Mm. It's not just a moment for, for now for us. And the other thing that is kind of connected, I think, you, re you reminded me as well of, um, you know, I love the idea that uh, and, and I can see it very clearly, obviously, with your work of, uh, you know, I need, you said, I need, ultimately, I need the person interacting with the interactive work to make the work. And so this incompleteness, because until the, the person interacting arrives, the work is not, is not itself yet. Now, what I like of that is also that there is a space of choice you can choose how much you're going to interact or not and how much you're going to get moved or not by the experience you know i'm sure there's some people say well that was a full-on experience and other people say yeah yeah i didn't really like it so much and then they move on and they just carry on as usual right so it's interesting because uh in my work um what I found is that, you know, as I mentioned to you before many times, uh, I receive a lot of emails from people just basically uh, thanking me, not because I've done anything for them, but it's like, a, it's more like about remembering. They're like, oh, you know, I always knew, but I just, uh, I feel like now I'm allowed to say that I knew and I'm allowed to say that I have all of these experiences and these feelings and and so it's almost like uh, the science, instead of uh, providing new language and new words to describe how the world works, somehow has reduced the word and the work. And, uh, and so that we don't actually know anymore how to express what it is part of, the, of what we are experiencing. And, mm -hmm. and if science is about describing what's happening, then how it comes the science refuses to explain or to at least describe what's happening and it puts the words it takes the words away so that you can't actually describe it and then you have to rely on on other other kind of languages uh from other you know practices to try and approximate that and uh, and it's interesting also because uh Every so often, not very often, it has happened very rarely actually, and it's always the same 
couple of characters that keep, you know, somehow they, I think that they're enjoying themselves. So I let them do it, what to do. <laughs> but I get emails. And once I got this email, I think maybe I even shared it with you. This is from a well-known, very res well-respected and very whatever, whatever, high-ranking uh, professor, scientist. And, um, and, you know, I received this email. They said, like, all he said was, the empire strikes back. And I was like, and the email was, a com that was the entire email. That was the text. And it was accompanied by a, um, a PDF attached of yet another opinion paper about, you know, plant intelligence or plant consciousness and whatever. And so uh, it's interesting to me because at that point, I actually have to turn into the scientist. And, you know, and while... Of course, everyone is open to have their own opinion. I have to stress that if we're talking about science, then I would like to see their data, which they don't have. So uh, it's just, the, again, is the game of how we use these practices and what they allow us to do. And, um, and so I guess similar to yours is like for most people, uh, the interaction with my work seems to be something that gives them the opportunity if they choose so to, change their mind literally and see and feel and experience something else that they were it was probably already there but now it's like oh that's what it is now i know it and they can go away feeling a little bit uh, more allowed but then there are those that uh, are still very much attached to the colonial imperial actually in this uh, in this case <laughs> that is the empire that strikes back and uh, and I guess, I guess what I like of what you just shared before is that in a way it reminds me for myself and for my own work that, yeah, they're free to also choose to stay in the empire. The consequences of the empire though, of a seven generation are pretty dear. So at this time, especially at this time, I think that, um, you know, everyone is free to choose what they want, but um, it needs to be done with responsibility and the responsibility to the, to the future. And, uh, and in that sense, yeah, no, they don't have the luxury of uh, having an empire that keeps striking. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just um, you help me reflect on this so thank you i don't know if it makes any sense but yeah no it, it makes sense does. for me <laughs> but to yeah to remember the future i think that there is um you know i feel that I, one of the things that you know I've, i found helpful and interesting in your book thus spoke the plant is this moment you know when you talk about the many different kind of ways we were um the kind of within aristotle like greek um, theory in terms of how we could have organized um, the hierarchy between humans, plants, and animals. And, and you mentioned Aristotle. And, you know, there is these alternative kind of versions of history where I don't know, like, that this, this, that this particular frame just was different. And, and I think the kind of, you know, obviously, this isn't about critiquing science as like a process, mm. it is extremely important as a process. But this, this moment where you realize, of course, this is also a lens. And I guess the irony or perhaps the challenge with it, it's a lens that also claims that the lens does not exist. It's a lens that argues that objectivity is, is its lens and therefore it's superior because everything else is subjective. And, and you know, in many ways, messages to a post-human earth is about embracing subjectivity. You know, like I remember, you know, when we were doing the prototype a year ago, one of the comments was, oh, I feel like this is too much about humans, you know, can it be more about plants? And I really did think about that, like, should it be, you know, it was the same thing about like, don't, anth I wasn't quite anthropomorphizing plants, but it was just kind of like, the humans are here, I was like, and I, and I did struggle a bit, you know, like, was this a critique? Should humans not be part of the story? And, and I feel what we've talked about this a lot about, actually, it is a, it is an experience about plant communication and plant um, kind of let the, the lens of the plant world, which is just 
happily a fiction, a fantasy, but it, it's, it becomes mostly about how you are perceived in this particular woodland, in this particular moment, and the relationship between you and your nearby neighbors in that moment, as opposed to necessarily just thinking about them with the, each other in kind of a clinical, abstract, objective way where you're not mm -hmm. in the lens. Um, and that like embracing subjectivity is something that is I think the sticking point or what is argued against your work is this kind of desire that somehow you've painted something which is too, too much of a kind of a human need to tell the story. But there's also something which I feel is kind of perhaps responding to how people are at the moment where I feel that there is, um, there is a kind of, a, you know, to, to some degree, the positive responses of this work so far, I don't necessarily think is purely because of the project. It's really because where people are at the moment and the kind of things that they want to be able to ease themselves into this sense of they know that there is a disconnection between themselves and the world around mm -hmm. them, but they know that and it's really just empowering them to say um, it's here and it's quite close and actually it's completely accessible and I don't need a mediator. It's kind of, I don't know, it's like you don't need a priest to get to God. You actually, this is your body and you have a kinship with this situation already. And so that kind of immediacy, I think, is what this work offers and also what your work offers, of course, as an inspiration. And I was reading something this morning, you know, about this argument that people... I think it was kind of saying that like uh, people have decided not to have children because they feel that this is a burden on the planet and that there's this kind of increased sense of like as it's the ecologically responsible decision to not have a child but just as you were saying this thing of the seventh generation I was just thinking oh you know but like actually does this actually mean perhaps you're there's there's almost a responsibility to have a connection to the future um through not necessarily saying that children are the only way to connect to the future but like it's such a clinical somehow like rational mathematical decision to say resources mm -hmm. per person per population per decision ergo end population whereas kind of this idea of what's the seventh generation it's like a very like love subjective relationship with the future on earth it's very different and it felt that those that in in this conversation there is this kind of the attitude you know it's a very subtle but significant attitude between how we feel we can be part of this ecosystem ultimately mm -hmm. both arguments are to kind of protect the future but in very different um approaches mm -hmm. And I guess the, the, the key is exactly that for me, at least, is until we are so convinced that in one way or another we can be out of the picture. Like, I want to have kids so that I'm actually not contributing to this problem. <laughs> or, you know, like, any stance is like, basically, if, you are, if your decision is based on... Uh, on um, the consequences now, uh, I think it's short-sighted. It's, it's inevitably short-sighted. And it, in a way, as you described perfectly, it's like, it's uh, because of is not feeling into the issue, but is thinking what is the issue. Uh, it's actually um, objectifying the human one more time, again. And in that process, we are creating the very problem. You know, the, the problem is the objectification of the world, and we are the world. So by anywhere where we are trying to objectify ourselves, the other, the issue, wherever we are trying to objectify the, 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 the thing in the matter, then suddenly we are at risk of creating or perpetuating the very problem that is causing the distress that we are in. And, uh, and in a way, the reason why science is so at the forefront of the conversation is because, well, objectification is supposed to be part of its method. 
Mm-hmm. But in that sense, then, well, then we need a new science. Just because objectification is supposed to be part of the scientific method, then well, we change the method. Obviously, the method is not going to work for us like this, and it's not going to work for the next seven generations. It doesn't mean that we don't have to use a scientific approach to how we explore the world, but that doesn't like there's nothing in the method that says that you have to be objectifying the other. And uh, so that's almost kind of like an extra, <laughs> an extra ingredient that is obviously not really necessary. Beside, and I'm, I am doing some work with other colleagues on this, and again, as often is the case, there are much many, there are many more of us thinking this way than we suspect, mm-hmm. or I suspected, and I'm talking about scientists. Uh, and we are writing, at the moment we are writing, and we have been working on this for a while, about how a science that uh, embraces the subjectivity of the observer, who is non-observer because you never are, you're part of, um, allows for a much deeper understanding. And not only that, but sometimes it allows for understanding, full stop. Mm -hmm. An understanding that becomes not available unless you're prepared to acknowledge that you're there and you are totally part of the picture. And without you, that picture is a totally different picture that you will never know. And so as as we start talking about these, and I'm talking about scientists, mostly for some reason, mostly women, I don't know why, but uh, it seems (laughs) there is a trend there. Um, Yeah, the stories are never ending. It's like, oh, yeah, I also, and oh, I also. And these are like, you know, people working with fish and chimpanzee and lions and then plants. And like, it's everywhere. And, and I think that the, the, the momentum that I'm feeling is that actually there are so many of us that potentially, um, yeah, science is already a different science. Science has already changed, even if we don't... No, explicitly, yeah. explicitly recognize that yet yeah mm. yeah towards like a revolution in the scientific method approach kind of you can see very much the the kind of potential there I think in terms of like you said mm-hmm. in many ways it's the bridge it's kind of walking back and forth over that bridge constantly like taking planting one thing from That's the right. other and being like this is also an experiential truth you know it's it's right you, you there are, and, and, and I guess we, we, we probably won't have time to go into it, and we haven't even really touched on the book or your work with Lake Mungo, <laughs> but, you know, last time we spoke, you talked about a research and a research paper that we're working on, which is a collaboration between yourself and also um, a collection of trees and putting t- together both of the stories within within the mm. within the project and I'm very excited about that I'm not sure obviously you haven't been able to travel as much as perhaps you'd have liked to this that's year. right but uh, you know, we haven't been able to travel at time. all okay <laughs> yeah that's right so it's actually been postponed over and over again and and every time but then I also understand that um when is the right time I will be there and as the, I've been told many times before, especially the big trees, is like, don't worry, we are not in a hurry. You know, when you get your chance, you just come and it's okay. So, yeah. In the meantime, because we've been in lockdown and we can't go anywhere, uh, I have a big tree on the land where I'm renting. And uh, so I started climbing the tree regularly as my kind of therapy and actually uh, a friend of mine said to me when sometimes he sees me that I'm unsettled and he said just just go just go and climb your tree because usually when I come back I just feel like more zen and much happier than before I went and and often I just um, I just sit and uh, I put my hydrophones underneath the tree, put my headphone on, and I just listen to the sounds of the tree. And and last time I was there, I actually at one point, because it felt so loud, at one point I took my headphones off and I just put my ear really close. And I just, I felt like I was a koala 
because I had my arms around one of the trunks, my leg dangling down. And, and I was just sitting there. And I think I, I was there for quite some time. I just didn't realize because I was just, yeah, I'm just going to stay here. And, and I could hear as well as I was when I was wearing the headphones. And um, yeah, so again, the, in the matter of, uh, on the question of, making things accessible using a, uh, a language, in this case, it's body language that allows us literally to engage with this other. It's totally possible, it's right there. And in a way, as I experienced myself, um, it's actually very therapeutic. You know, it's like uh, it allows us to connect to an aspect of life that really has the, this very deep, powerful, soothing, effect on our neurology so why not <laughs> and you know i mean i know that there is like a uh, forest bathing and all of that but this is like uh, basically just sit under a tree or just go and hug a tree if you don't climb it's fine it's like uh, yeah it's very simple and we are making things very complicated at times it's not necessary it's just yeah so I guess the, the a work like yours, May, is, um, is literally, a, it's a strong provocation because I guess people will realize like, hey, but actually I can probably just go for a walk in the forest to do this. <laughs> and then it's a new, yeah, but it's like, yeah, exactly. That's what ultimately we want you to do. Go, go to the forest and do, do this. So yeah, you don't need augmented yeah. reality. It's just, it's just the it's just a bit just a to remind bit. you of course yeah it's and i mean that's right Amazing. listening is, is really just an it's just the offer to be open and once once the openness is once you figure out where your open button is then you can press it whenever whenever you want that's so, right i'm going to say as well that um this project will be all in this gallery, which is in london which is in you know a city filled with colonial history of, it, of anywhere and it has a woodland it has in a city people it has a place you go and find what you were talking about monica like so even in our city even in our um most um manufactured of landscapes you know it has a place where you can um, find this um, space of that's filled with humanity, filled with common sense, filled with you know things, something that isn't radical at all. And sometimes stuff gets placed in a radical place. Whereas actually, I think when you find it, it's like oh, this is actually where we should be. Um, and and I and being able to host this you know messages to approach human earth and the, the the cutting edge thoughts and ideas which as you say are borrowed from humanity from centuries ago or from other cultures in many ways that actually um i hope that the thousands of people that go through our site every day um because it has that woodland it's a public space open and free for through and a lot of people with their dogs and um you know how much they over recognize their filling up of um their their place as part of that ecosystem that they actually over mm. get or whether they just like intrinsically feel it i think is is what we want the, that place that site to really accentuate to allow for everybody to be able to find them this this in in that place mm -hmm. and and so i think how these places can start to host these discussions um is so is so rich and so i think not wanting to be naive but hopeful so full of um really lovely um refocusing of 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 ourselves into kind of thinking seven generations of the future that it's not just about the 
you know, all the stuff that to do with climate emergency and biodiversity emergency and everything else that actually there's a real personal like shift from some something something really um energizing to talk about to tell stories about and conjure up kind of imagination in those spaces that is born out of the knowledge that we're talking about the kind of scientific inquiry and everything i think that these places whether you know whether it is in the right in the city center and you know with a few birds and trees or whether it really is out in a wilderness um you know we can find it in those places and so with this particular project and the wider cultural reforesting project i kind of really hope that audiences participants um i never quite find the right word because it, all those things feel borrowed again from a place that um, you know humans perhaps um will leave the, the experience and hold something that is just in them forevermore let's say or for, for their kind of everyday experience outside of that 45 minutes or half an hour for, for the actual experience itself and i think that is what i hope we can conjure up in people and as you say more and more the momentum is more and more people are finding in themselves that this is where they perhaps are heading and so i hope that that can and i think it is that that translates into the wider public as well um mm. that's where i think we're sitting yeah the the it reminds me of uh, again two things there one thing that it reminds me of because i had that conversation with a friend and i said oh you know because of this lockdown it's impossible to be on country <laughs> and he looked at me and he said like, but monica you're always on country where else can you be you're always on country so even if the you are living in the middle of the city and there's only concrete that's what you see well under the concrete there is always country the earth is there we are like we can cover it we can put all sorts of dresses on and some of them are more or less pretty uh we can even like give her a haircut modify whatever but ultimately country or the earth it's always there so we are we cannot possibly be anywhere else but always at home always right where we need to be and uh, of course in places where um, there is a wilderness as we would like to see it and there is also a lot of romantic ideas attached to wilderness because uh, you know probably i don't know but i would probably not survive very long if i was just placing wildness for myself so it's like i don't know about you guys but so there is a romantic idea but still the wild it's everywhere the wild is right under our feet, even when it's covered with concrete. So the wild is here because what are we if not the wild? And uh, and that also reminds me of this uh, seven generation thing. That, and it's funny that I had to use the my science hat to to answer to this or to you know to speak to this because uh, you know I think people find it difficult to think of seven generation because they're like yeah, that's a long time and we are quite short memory you know like we don't remember for too far too long but um and and trying to engender an emotional link to that it might be difficult like yeah just think of your grand 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 grandchildren you know and be like yeah i don't know but okay so here is where science might be actually useful in this situation because it's like uh, the genes and the building block literally the chemicals the the cells that makes that are making your body every day because your body is being remade every day they will continue making your body your body is being made from all of the bones and the ashes of millions and millions and millions of bodies like this of a millennia and it will continue to make that so the seventh generation is actually literally your own body traveling into the future just in a different form so we are obsessed with like eternal youth and living forever well we are already living forever 
and we just need to create, wouldn't you, if you knew you were going to be here for another seven generations, <laughs> instead of thinking that the seven generation is somebody else's, but it's like, no, it's you. So wouldn't you want to make it a nice place? So you really want to give like a horrible place for yourself to be in seven generations time. So, and then, and then in this way, the, the now and the future collapse onto the, each other because there is there is no time i mean that's perfect okay. ending and beginning perhaps <laughs> <laughs> yeah indeed um wonderful and um, before before did you want to say anything more particular to messages the post first like because no, obviously we haven't really talked about Stanislav um, or anything like that. Happy to, to not. I think, I mean, I could just pick up on what you've just said, because this thing about time collapses, I think that is mm. so much part of the experience of the project. And I think Stanislaw Lem, so the, the piece has been um, co-produced with the Adam Mikovich Institute to mark the 100th anniversary of the birth of Stanislaw Lem. So Stanislaw Lem is a Polish science fiction writer. Most people have known him because of his book Solaris, but his, I mean, he's extremely pro prolific um, in many ways, a bit of a recluse. Um, and I think there's this power in his writings, this kind of the, I guess we were talking about like the role of artists and I think the role of science fiction to kind of sit outside time, to kind of just be almost just very free in terms of thinking forwards and backwards and outside of like the context we're in, in, in a way to alienate ourselves from now, enough for us to see now. And, um, and just, just going back to obviously, so, you know, his, in terms of the context, you know, in the eight, in 1982, this US government led um, task group that were looking at how to leave messages into the future. And when you read his essay, I mean, it's very, you know, his writing is often extremely funny, but this is a not, it, this is a effectively a piece of nonfiction written by a science fiction writer. And this kind of the madness of that, like really attracted me to it at, at the beginning, because, you know, I, I want people, like, I love the idea that you have to take art seriously, because obviously I think you do. <laughs> and so the fact that there is this kind of unique role for the imagination um, in a functional way. And so his essay, which he's kind of, he, he does, he kind of goes through this series of questions, almost like in the scientific method of like, if we have to leave a method to, message to the future, well, obviously everything else will have gone, you know, what materials are left, okay? But yet we have this organic matter that will reproduce and what does that reproduction, what, what happens now if you start something that then gets reproduced? And in a way, like, it's a mad idea. I think it's in many ways a terrible idea, but it's such an exciting thought experiment to ask people to think at that length of time, a little bit like now when you're saying, you know, your molecules, you continue. And I think that in many ways, like people respond, it's it's a challenge to, we, we have like a very strong edge, you know, in many ways, like our physical edge, our mental edge, our focus is often, you know, it, there's no kind of problem with necessarily just having to put things in boxes because if you have things in boxes you can do stuff with them but every so often just the opportunity to like step step outside of those those systems which categorize things including the ones we use to categorize ourselves is if it's kind of held in a way that's not scary then it's it's an extremely human and like powerful feeling and, you know, just in terms of kind of the comments that we got um, whilst the piece was in Krakow, in like the resting place of Stanislaw Lem, you know, 
the things I really enjoyed people, I mean, at some point I was having a conversation with someone saying like, you know, this is a very depressing subject. You are talking about the extinction of humans, you know? And I was like, yeah, but how did you feel afterwards? He's like, well, I just felt really full of joy. And I was like, yes, it's, it's this kind of post apocalyptic, joyful story, which I think now is something that, you know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of apocalyptic climate um, narratives. And in a way, I think, just finding a place where we can think about those things without feeling closed and terrified, feeling like open and ready and, and creative actually, when we're thinking about that is, I kind of just think it's almost like a muscle, which is just helpful to learn how to build as opposed to always thinking the end is disastrous, you know, and therefore we have this very urgent, very panicky, very frenetic way of thinking about it. I will not have children, which I'm, I'm not saying that people should or shouldn't have children. Like, it's just more like, it's so calc, it's, it's so numerical. It's like one, you know, you know, nobody thinks their child is one in the number of people that, you know, we don't have a kind of mathematical relationship with the population. Like that is just not how anybody feels about, that's, you know, that's, if that was the case, then, deaths wouldn't bother you you know like there's <laughs> not everybody is one on the planet but we begin to think that because we are thinking anyway that's the other point it's more like can you create a space where we can think about the edges of our life expectancy and human life expectancy and destruction in a way that does not engender just panic and terror um which has its purpose and i'm you know i'm not saying that i have any I'm faulting people who kind of job it is to make sure that these like alarming headlines maintain their profile in news but it's also important to just foster kind of a softer place where we can think and experience and be and also think about these things which are in many ways quite scary um, but in a, like a way where we can trust that we won't be left with the darkness. Left with the darkness. Left out with the diary. Yeah, lovely place to leave. Uh, <laughs> Another ending. <laughs> <laughs> or a beginning. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. Um, but yeah, thank you very, very much, both. Um, that was really, really fascinating and, and um, yeah, energising. So thank you very much, Monica. Hey. That was great. Yes. Thank you so much, Andy. And Monica. Yeah, I think